नमस्कार वेलकम टू द वीकेंड एडिटोरियल एंड वीकेंड एडिटोरियल इज वेयर वी स्पीक अबाउट बुक्स वी स्पीक अबाउट ऑथर्स वी स्पीक अबाउट प्रोफेशनल्स ओके टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू डू दिस बुक रिव्यू द बुक इज कॉल्ड रिलीजियस नेशनलिज्म सोशल परसेप्शंस एंड वायलेंस इट्स अ ब्यूटीफुल बुक रिटन बाय मिस्टर राम पुण्यानी प्रोफेसर राम पुण्यानी इज समबडी आई रिस्पेक्ट अ लॉट i respect a lot i love hearing him i love listening to his speeches i love listening to his uh, his lectures and i love reading his books mr ram punyani is uh, the chairman of center for study of society and secularism and uh, is engaged in activism and promotes secularism in india and that's something that i revere him for so uh, without much ado let's uh, get into this interview and let's talk about religious nationalism social perceptions and violence let's get right into the show mr ram punyani thank you so much sir thank you so much for joining me on this show and thank you very much for writing such a beautiful brilliant book religious nationalism social perspective and violence thank you sir, sir a very well written book and uh, let's talk about this book today sir yes. i will directly get into the question tell me sir you say that aryans are invaders actually what i say our aryans came here in the wave of migrations uh, i don't say that they are invaders because there were multiple migrations there was no planned attack as such uh because in this subcontinent there have been various migrations starting from the first one which took place from south africa 65000 years ago and then uh, in the second or third migration aryans came from the uh, central asia and that part of uh, asia so it is uh, i i what i hold uh, depending on actually many sources is that there was a series of waves of migration of aryans now sir, many people apologies uh, sorry to interrupt you called it the aryan invasion theory yeah correct yeah? so I, i wanted to talk about that i wanted to talk about that sir correct because i don't call it aryan uh, invasion there are some people who hold that aryans had invaded so this aryan invasion theory was put forward by particular uh, at a particular time by uh, the westerners uh, to justify and to try to explain uh, the aryans coming here because there are two things here like uh, many of the europeans uh, uh, race theory of course is now debunked they also hold that uh, they are also aryans the way hitler also uh, held that uh, they are aryans and they are superior races so at particular time some scholars and some political people felt that it was a invasion by aryans in this which i hold is wrong theory it was no invasion of any sort it was a migration uh, uh, in the waves so uh, technically speaking uh, mughals has invaded india which there is no uh, no doubt about uh, but so are aryans even aryans are not indians per se so there are two foreigners and now <laughs> one foreigner is calling another foreigner foreigner is it that uh... Uh, that's interesting actually uh, when we say indians uh, basically we are referring to the subcontinent india as it became a republic after 1947 is one category and earlier there were different kingdoms because see uh, the nation state does not come into exist centuries ago nation state is just a concept 300 years ago Yes. so earlier because uh, there were so you are in a way it is right that even uh, many of the mughals of course are the last in the series of muslim uh, invaders earlier of course there were gulam vansh the gulam dynasty khalji and uh, uh, ghaznavi so they had all come from 11th century onwards so it was you know uh, a free for all at that time uh, kings were trying to expand and uh, it was not any religious motive it was a motive of power so they uh, like uh, what what uh, these people call mughals as invaders and foreigners has totally no meaning 
because nobody is in that way uh, a foreigner uh, the concept of nation state foreigner concept comes with the concept of nation state earlier you know the visa passport and to which uh, this thing area you belong was not there the kings were trying to expand their powers and now because of this prevalent communal historiography people think that if people of my religion uh, king of my religion he expands his empire to afghanistan and to philippines and this thing is a great king but if the other king and kings have been coming right from alexander down to uh, the babar now this is a sequence in which different kings tried to attack this uh, subcontinent so in that sense uh, we foreigner native concept i will be very difficult to uh, comment and uh, of course i must quote here that there is very important work by tony joseph early indians and there there he tries to say we are all mixed up people kept migrating because of earlier you know when pastoral society was there people were looking for greener pastures and in the search for greener pastures they did uh, look for other places and they did go and settle uh, in other places also and when aryans also came they had also tiff with the uh, earlier natives who were staying here who exactly brought hindu to india hinduism to india sanatan dharma to india was it yeah. a gift of aryans see uh, now uh, actually hinduism as a religion is one concept but uh, hindu as a word hindu as a word begins something around uh, 7th 8th century when uh, people coming from the western side they used to come across the river indus sindhu and in their language the word s s is used less often and in place of that sometimes they use word h so they started the using the word hindu so hindu word began as a geographical category for this region and then what happened that at that time there were many religious traditions people think there was one particular religion there are many religions prevalent here at that time nath tantra bhag uh, shaiv siddhant jainism buddhism ajivikas these were all uh, prevailing here so jainism and buddhism had a very clear cut a uh, structure of a religion but all other traditions gradually later on were put together actually that is a 19th century british construct where all these religions were put together and hinduism as a religion word was used so let me put it again because this is quite confusing Please. so first word comes uh, first comes the word hindu as a geographical category for the area east of indus now this word same word hindu is used for the people living in this subcontinent third that there are diverse religious tendencies there is nothing like a single religion hinduism hinduism is not a prophet based religion like islam and christianity or sikhism or um, uh, buddhism hinduism is a collection of multiple streams which were prevailing here and that comes actually much later in the 19th century so in, in response to because this is very confusing so hinduism word uh, properly was first used by british earlier to that the word which was used by hindu hindu first in the geographical sense then in the sense of the people living in this area while well, people were very clear for their religious identities people were calling themselves jain buddha ajivikas nath tantra all those people used to identify by this not very old you know like even when uh, uh, as a child when i asked my grandfather this is a very classical example i asked him who are we my grandfather did not say we are hindus he said we are vaishnavas so that is what was prevalent shaiv vaishnav and we also know that shaiv and vaishnavas are used to have conflicts uh, shia sunni used to have shia sunni of course let's not bring that here but there were many sub religious uh, uh, tendencies which were having and conflicting with each other if because of social reasons uh, at particular times so when british came here they were very confused very confused in the sense what is the religion of these people some people are calling themselves vaishnav some are shaiv so they on their own they said okay muslims are well defined christians are well defined and these other people who are hindus they then they designed designed the word 
Hinduism as a religion for that. And then Baba Sahib Ambedkar later on uh, tells us that, that Hinduism has two streams. One is a stream which is Brahminical. Another is a stream which is Shramanical. Shramanical includes Nath, Tantra and all that. Brahminical includes those who follow this uh, Vedas, Purush, Sukta, Manusmriti, means caste and gender hierarchy. So that is one Brahminical stream. And the other streams are which are away from uh, such values. Forgive my uh, ignorance, but I still want to understand this a little more clearly. Yeah. Sir, is Hindu religion, has Hindu religion been bought to India by the Aryans? Uh, that is a difficult question to say. Your, your things is, uh, see, what Aryans were practicing, Aryans were practicing uh, when they came here, that also got transformed after coming here. But in a way, what Aryans brought in was Vedic religion, Vedic and Brahminical stream of Hinduism, one you can say. May I ask you another question then? Just to yeah. say, sir, yeah. was Ram a, a Aryan or a, a non Aryan? Was Ram an Aryan? Ram, Ram and Krishna, these are the Aryan figures. These are the Aryan figures in the mythology. Now, see again, these questions are again, there are various answers to this. Uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata are the great epics which had been superbly uh, 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 popular here. And uh, so this was, some people say that Ramayana and Mahabharata are a sort of a reflection, uh, especially Ram, what you are saying, a reflection of Aryans and the original native Dravids, the fight between the two of them. Some people hold to that particular thing. So Ram was definitely... Uh, though it is a mythological figure, it is difficult to comment uh, accurately on mythology. History, you can comment very accurately. So Ram, one can say, was a Aryan. I want to go to the Mughals. Uh, yeah. Or I want to go to uh, the invaders who yeah. brought in Islam to India. Yeah. So if I look at it, there is certain parallel that we can draw. Because Aryan okay. came and we were we accepted them they were they became part of our lives and today we call ourselves uh, uh, we 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 kind of associate ourselves with that life that's yeah. the current hinduism which is actually a mix of aryan influence and the the local uh, no. religion which was existing now let's go to mughal we still now look at mughals as outsiders while <laughs> they too uh, technically speaking, is the same uh, thing. They came to India. They settled in India. They lived in India. It is not that they took something away from India and went away. They lived in India. They too started practicing their religion in India. But we see them as outsiders. Sir, why? Why, why is this difference? Two things I will say. First, I will. Uh, I, you have got the question very appropriately. First is, of course, I must say that Islam did not came with the Muslim rulers. Islam first came in 8th century in Kerala, Malabar coast, so with the Arab traders. With the Arab traders it came. And then in the 8th century, there was one king who attacked Sindh, Sindh part of subcontinent in 8th century, Muhammad bin Qasim. And from 11th century onwards, different Mughal, different Muslim dynasties came. But they did not spread Islam. That is the whole thing. That's what uh, we think that it, it is a Muslim kings who brought Islam to India. That is not a correct picture. Correct picture is that the Arab traders brought it. Islam started spreading through because of the many people, as Swami Vivekanand points out, people wanted to escape the caste tyranny. And when they came across the other religion where there was no apparent inequality, so many of the uh, low caste and many of those victims of this, they embraced uh, Islam. So, in a way, <laughs> what parallel you are trying to do is very interesting that uh, Aryans brought in Hinduism, Mughals brought in uh, Islam. So, what is the problem? So, in a way, there is a subtly we have to see that it is not uh, Aryans basically we are practicing close to what we can say Brahminic, Brahminic part of Hinduism. It was not because there were other there are other traditions of Hinduism also. And Islam came in in a different way. Islam right. came in, Muslim kings came. Islam got acceptability. But people uh, embrace Islam not because of the kings. They embrace more to escape the caste tyranny, as Swami Vivekananda points out, and also 
it was a sufi saints whose influence uh, the people had because sufi saints did not practice uh, touchability untouchability purity pollution and they were very popular like uh, bhakti saints and sufi saints they have one common thing both emphasize on the moral aspects of religion and they both uh, try to go away from the caste system so because actually i will say caste system is a major cause because of which islam uh, spread here and muslim kings of course uh, they they were muslims in a way yes that is true and the question i asked you is specifically i want to draw your attention to page 65 Okay, sir. Where you say M. S. Goelkar, the second Sang- Sir Sangha Chalak Supremo of the R. S. S. states in his tract that we are nation nationhood defined that Hindus and Hindus alone are the original <laughs> inhabitants of India. Sir, <laughs> then how true is this statement? This is totally a fabrication. This is totally a construction. Now here I'll tell you that any type of sectarian narrow nationalism it constructs its history its history in a way where it tries to show itself as the first comer see i was trying to study a bit uh, understand a bit about sinhala sinhala politics so there uh, those who are showing is trying to say that uh, sri lanka is basically a sinhala nation others are aliens they also claim that sinhalis are the first comers here as hindutva ideology which i have defined later uh, hindutva ideology started developing it constructed its past like nehru and gandhi they constructed their past the different communities have come they have lived they have interacted they have lived here so hindu nationalists constructed their past in their own interest that we have been here right from the beginning and we are the real owner of this thing to show that muslims and christians they are aliens so because this concept does not hold at that time who is a alien alien and who is a native this concept starts uh, getting formed up after a uh, nation state comes into being and india mainly after the colonial period during freedom period it uh, starts getting consolidated so so in a way i mean um, this is this has to be understood in that sense before i get into uh, rss like i told you which i want to sir i want uh, to understand uh, while i know that we are talking about savarkar savarkar defined savarkar coined the word hindutva sir mm. i want to know the concept of hindutva from you sir yeah see hindutva in a way you know the the word we, i explained the word or genesis of hindu geographical right and for the people of this land now then what comes that it becomes a sort of a organized religion in 19th century and uh, the first time there is a cons- within the, within hinduism also there are two streams brahmanical streams and shramanical streams like if you see the values of bhakti kabir tukaram namdev narsi mehta or even our uh, in kerala what narayan guru their values are totally away from the brahmanical values so this is what uh, hinduism as a religion is today if i want to say hinduism as a religion that it is uh, it has definitely clear cut two tendencies one brahmanism which holds to caste and gender hierarchy and other shramanism like the this all saints which don't believe in hierarchy of caste and gender so this was one now in 1892 uh, one uh, of the hindus uh, chandranath basu he first used the word hindutva 1892 was the first time it was he, not it was not uh, savarkar yeah. no savarkar Ch- savarkar gave a total political meaning to it and that is what stuck so chandranath basu was saying that it is a in his sense a humanism and he tried to outline the positive aspects of uh, different traditions diversity pluralism which were there now savarkar when he uh, gets uh, he is in the andaman and he wants to get released by all that we I, i will not go into that time he defines hindutva and he says hindu hindutva is not just hinduism it is total hinduness and it has three foundations foundation number 1 aryan race please note today what they will like to undermine aryan race number 2 this land from indus to the sea and three this culture 
and by culture he meant the brahminical culture Correct. so what savarkar defined as hindutva became the bottom line and the starting point for rss politics now here we see there are two two things going on together on one side there is understanding like that of savarkar and on other side gandhi himself talks of hinduism but gandhi's hinduism is the one which is plural diverse accepting and compassionate and humane so that's why he can say ishwar allah te allah tero naam well for for savarkar the and it's uh, further people who came up uh, as successors they stuck to that definition hindus means uh, aryans hindus means this uh, brahminical culture hindu is a miss this land so that's why your original sentence that golwalkar that's why golwalkar said that this land land belongs to hindus all the time and muslims are foreigners christians are foreigner and the second aspect of course which they try to say that it was those values which are most uh, important for us and those were again the values of caste and gender hierarchy this is very important for me to understand the politics of any sectarian nationalist it may be hindutva it may be islamism it may be christian fundamentalism or even buddhist fundamentalism to to them the central key is to regard the people of other religion as foreigners and number 2 to impose the hierarchical values on the society many places in your book you mentioned this concept of brahmical culture so what exactly do you mean by brahmical culture sir for my viewers yeah brahminical culture you know it uh, begins with uh, as you said aryans way vedic culture and uh, rigveda is the most original uh, uh, of the vedas in which there is one purush sukta purush sukta actually is the core defining point of brahminical culture and what does he say how did uh, how did varna varna which is again is synonymous with color and also uh, later on jati also got added up to this so he uh, in purush sukta a question is asked how did the different varnas came into being and the answer is given that lord brahma himself divided the primeval man virat purush into four parts from the mouth came brahmins from the arms came kshatriyas from the thighs came vaishyas and from from the foot came uh, the shudras so this is the core of brahminical values which was elaborated further in detail in manusmriti manusmriti that's why baba sahab went on to burn that because he was totally uh, for social justice and equality and all that so this is where brahminical culture means all those and of course now this cannot be mixed up but in vedic times uh, before the coming of uh, lord gautam buddha we saw that uh, their main things were prayers prayers to fire prayers to uh, different gods in ch- those who were controlling uh, air clouds uh, other things so and there was a there was brahminical culture now of course it is not uh, uh, easy to say but at that time sacrifice of the cow was one of the central features of the vedic times which swami vekanand also points out professor d n jha in his scholarship also proves and of course it was a protest by lord gautam buddha that this unnecessary killing of the animals is not correct we will require animals for our agriculture that basically how i understand it how uh, jainism buddhism they talked of non violence not killing the animals that's how this came and this also is runs parallel with the change in the production process of society so far society is pastoral aryans were primarily pastoral society now you are going into agricultural society now in agricultural society for doing the agriculture you require bulls you will require cows and all that so this is in a way i am giving the material explanation for the spiritual uh, teachings which uh, lord gautam buddha did but brahminical culture if you want to say brahminical culture uh, brahminical culture is primarily based on the uh hierarchy of caste and gender that's what i will hold if that is the case then for hindutva politics yeah. isn't it important to maintain and preserve brahminical culture because that's the only way you can you can actually practice hindu uh, hindutva politics isn't it correct 
see the, your this question uh, hindutva politics is a very right, right right one but you know you cannot implement the same values in the current times when the society changes now we are living in a global era where everybody where every dictator will try to pose as a democrat he will be a dictator but he will say i am a democrat so today you cannot talk of uh, putting the shudras to the lower scale or women into the secondary category you don't talk openly so you devise new strategy that how status quo is maintained but the language and the presentation changes and that is a challenge which i i must say rss has done excellently means keeping the core of brahminism alive and changing its covers where it looks equal so now what will they say all castes were equal all castes were equal because muslims tried to convert some people ran away to jungles forests and their caste fell down in status so so now they actually came out with a series of books that uh, this cobbler jati chamar jati or uh, like our prime minister wrote a book called karmayog he has withdrawn it in karmayog our prime minister writes that uh, uh, i believe that this valmikis manual scavenger scavengers we are doing it for spiritual pleasure see how you try to change your language let the people do what they want which is basically what brahminical culture basically means to me then i want to draw your attention to your page 237 please sir in page 237 you spoke about the three day function of rss that was held in 2018 and you say that in this function mr mohan bhagwat had clarified many things on its uh, political stance and ideology which yeah. pleased the liberals which pleased the yeah. liberals yeah. but but you conclude saying that rss wishes to do away with the constitution of india sir uh, ha, i want you to explain this to me sir yeah see as i told you now rss cannot retain the language of manuspruti rss has to adopt the language of democracy while retaining the core content of manusmriti so that is the one so when mohan bhagwat talks of uh, liberalism it it pleases many of the liberals and i had to respond to some of the good liberals also who felt that rss is changing and all that but uh, so far as you know once you keep glorifying the golden past golden past obviously gold in past what was there there were a lot of things one of the core thing was our social organization so when they say that, that our organization was uh, social organization kept us gave stability now golwalkar to mohan bhagwat there is a long journey of change in language Gol golwalkar frankly said that manusmriti lord manu was the greatest law giver he clearly put it out now mohan bhagwat will say that uh, no we will uh, adopt to the times and we are all equal also he will say now doing away with constitution if you notice you are a, uh, a journalist you will note it much more than that occasionally many of the bjp leaders uh, now one was from hegde or from karnataka who, who clearly said we are in the power to abolish constitution initially he used to say there are many our dharm sansads which also say today only i read a report by one of these swamis uh, that uh, indian constitution is not suitable for to indian culture so so they can speak in multiple tongues at the same time because their family is very vast family means fam their their uh, their group is very vast so they can talk of different languages but how i infer it how i infer it like a affirmative action for dalits whenever their chance comes they will oppose reservation even during last 7 years there are not too many chances but uh, in universities and other places wherever there is a possibility they will cut away with that because today dalits cannot come up towards the level of equality without proper affirmative action so in affirmative in contrast to that they floated the whole uh, youth for equality movement and second thing you see women we don't give much importance to the gender issue but we should think of gender issue also and when you think of rss as a organization 
इट्स नेम इज राष्ट्रीय स्वयं सेवक संघ ओके मैस्क्यूलाइन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इट इज इट इज ए एक्सक्लूसिवली मेल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड फॉर वेमेन फॉर वेमेन दे हैव ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कॉल्ड राष्ट्र सेविका समिति करेक्ट सो व्हाट डिड यू नोटिस दैट हियर द वर्ड स्वयं बीइंग करेक्ट मिसिंग and this is deliberately missing because according to every male dominated patriarchal ideology it may be of muslim fundamentalism christian fundamentalism women are regarded as a property of men that is a crux of the thing so mr bhagwat i think has taken up the challenge very brilliantly brilliantly in quotes how he is moderating his language which is which can be acceptable and confusing to many of the liberals forgetting now how do we understand rss not just by statements of mohan bhagwat we have to understand rss by what the young boys are trained in their shakhas or in their training programs in their shakhas and training programs which a, whosoever has access to that will know that they will tell the tell the same stories of the glorious values of the past of our systems being very good and atrocious muslim kings and great hindu kings so these these are the staple food of the rss pracharaks and swayam sevaks who come up in the shakhas and this is how they come up so uh, my feeling is that language and content has to be distinguished and language definitely they have been re- refining over a period of time and that's what we see in the language of mr mohan bhagat and that's what i have tried to see now second thing which i have also realized that probably formally they may not aim at abolishing indian constitution also they may not even aim at that keeping it where it is as a sacred place you practice the things which are totally against against those particular type of values which we are witnessing if we are sharp observers we can witness those things even in the current political atmosphere this gets me to a very basic question which is slightly different from uh, uh, what is the content of the book but all the same uh, the same you know as a country as a civilization we accepted the aryans we uh, merged our religion uh, with the aryan beliefs and we formed a, a very cohesive religion we accepted the uh, we accepted islam uh, people who came in we accepted them as part of it uh, and they flourished islam flourished we accepted uh, parsis we accepted christians we accepted so i want to ask you this question sir as people are we tolerant are we secular or as people are we what we seem to be now intolerant what are we see, see uh you have put the question very well and this is what gandhi and nehru said that from centuries different group of people have been coming and they have been mingling with each other the beauty of gandhi's hind swaraj where he talks about india's history is this precisely what you are saying people went on coming we went on interacting and changing and changing them also you know society is in the constant flux now this is a tolerant part of our society now actually intolerance develops with the uh, with the rise of sectarian nationalism muslim league hindu mahasabha and rss this is where the intolerant tendencies are sowed which and the perceptions are created very strongly one of the part of the titles of my book is social perceptions social perceptions start looking very real that day i was talking to one of the very uh, uh, great journalists and he was taking uh, talking that uh, the memories of uh, memories of operation of hindus during last centuries are going to come up how are you going to stop it so this is social perception that it was the hindus who were the victims that was the muslims who were the rulers there is nothing like that and as you in first part of your question you said people went on coming intermingling kings were now even kings which i have elaborated in detail none of the kings was ruling exclusively on the basis of people religion. of his his religion that and in the society also if you look at our culture it is totally intermixed culture you see music 
you see food habits you see the type of clothes you wear and the type of clothes i wear you see the type of uh, festivals we have see forget simple one example i'll give christians are 2.3% minority and most of the birthdays birthdays unless you become conscious and want to change it are by cutting the cake correct and so this is how what is natural so i i many times feel love and amity is natural and intolerance is planted by political intentions of some people who want to have a different path don't you think sir that a christian fundamentalist or a islamic yeah. fundamentalist and a hindu yeah. fundamentalist don't you think these three individuals are very similar in nature in fact they they are far more similar <laughs> than the liberals put together aren't they see liberals will be very different correct and we both will be agreeing disagreeing to each other more than agreeing to each other correct but while fundamental is you know there is a interesting tale which goes on that during emergency indira gandhi imposed that dark chapter of our history correct rss and jamaat e islami they were together in jail and they were thick as thieves because <laughs> most of the time they agreed with each other you are a hindu nation we are a muslims and so we have to be like that so fundamentalism basically what i now have come to understand that try to preserve pre democratic social structure in the modern form that's what fundamentalism is and i was even surprised to know that the first fundamentalism which came was not from islam not from hinduism it was in america in 1920s when the society started changing women started coming to the social space african americans started coming to the social space the conservatives came forward he said this is not according to our religion and here in west asia i also you see ayatollah khomeini he also said islam says this and the, the point of this fundamentalist is that they pick up one version of religion and they want to impose it on the society very aggressively very aggressively now who can be more religious than gandhi or molana azad but for that you are accepting others differences that's the whole difference that's why many times of course i never realized this greatness of mahatma gandhi earlier which i am realizing now that you can't have a better hindu than gandhi and you can't have a more liberal person than gandhi because he 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 presented his liberalism as a part of hinduism and nehru presented his liberalism in general in general political terms so this is where i think you are absolutely on the dot that fundamentalist of all religions they can go very well together <laughs> very well together and can live very happily and sometimes i feel they should be put together to enjoy their life and spare the whole society from their interpretations of religion i want to get to a slightly serious topic that you that you mention and i am referring to page 270 sir where you spoke about becoming clear that it is not a spontaneous phenomena nor is it a clash between two communities it is a planned violence sir you are saying that clash between two communities is not spontaneous like most of us think you say that clash between two communities are is a planned phenomena why do you say that sir see uh, now this there lot of research has been done and i'll quote some three important researches one is my own mentor asgar ali engineer has done a lot of research paul brass and latest research has come out from yale university now you know if those who have studied the communal violence they say that it is not spontaneous some people behind the screen they have the intentions of coming to power in a stronger way and that's why some things are planted like you know during fred freedom movement what used to happen some muslim used to go and put pork pork in a mosque some hindu used to go and plant beef in a temple and then there is a whole paraphernalia of organization which is not visible and but which operates subtly which operates subtly which goes on spreading rumor and unfortunate part sujit is that the people who take up arms to make it look like inter community affair they are the most downtrodden poor and deprived people they are incited by the politics 
like you see any any of these things that uh, so this is uh, observation which i have come to uh, pick up from mainly yale university and their recent observation is that wherever communal violence is orchestrated in those particular areas electoral strength of bjp goes up they have clearly showed it as a sort of a graph and it is a part of their study which uh, which of course i have not i have been observing it but uh, planned in that sense that there are some forces who are behind the scene who unleash this hysterical uh, hatred so that's why i will not call it as a fight between two communities it is one particular uh, group of people who want to come to power by polarizing the society and for polarizing the society communal violence is the i mean full proof full proof method for them and that's what we have seen during last uh, like after babri demolition on one side you see the graph of communal violence going up going up and other side you see the graph of communal party going up so this is a inference also and this may be uh, a part of many studies which have come out if then if you if you say and you say it with a lot of uh, research behind you when you say that most of the communal violence are orchestrated which means can we conclude this uh, uh, topic by saying that there is nothing called as religious fundamentalist there is a politician who uses religious fundamentalism to ensure that he gains his political power votes yeah there are two component actually there are two components of this, of this. there is a particular group of people who who are disturbed by the change in the social norms like if you i have tried to explain in this book also that this fundamentalism or communalism did not come in india when kings were ruling it comes during colonial period and it comes at a time when the power of the landlords and the uh, associated clergy starts declining so it is a defense reaction of them that they do not want the earlier values to disappear they wants that earlier high earlier social relationships to continue and then they try to present that it is a religious matter now one interesting thing i'll tell you that uh, when uh, when the education for the lads education for women education in the middle classes started coming up the landlords and uh, hindu and muslim landlords both they got very frightened and first thing they said that our religion is in danger our religion is in danger who was in danger their power was in danger correct if if things go up like this a democratic norms come up new industrial class comes up new industrial labor comes up new educated people come up who will become powerful and the power of the feudal lord and the associated clergy will decline so this they say as my religion in danger so here they pick up aspects of religion and they use it for coming for first rooting their power then coming to power then intensifying their power in that sense in pakistan it was easy like muslim league they got pakistan and they they ruined pakistan in no time so in in the sense i hope you understand what i mean absolutely absolutely and uh, so in india also now they are becoming more powerful there is no force which can competently oppose it on the ground and at the ideology so once they start becoming powerful the whole dynamics of the society starts changing the concerns of the society start changing nehru you know here one sentence of nehru is very important which i am trying to sort of uh, draw from him when he said that while inaugurating bhakra nangal dam he says these are the modern temples of india yes okay so what how, how i expand it the university is the scientific laboratory is the research the facilities for irrigation facilities for other thing these are the modern temples of india and from 1992 they are saying under this mosque the temple is located correct so the temple definition of a person like nehru whom i will like to respect and the definition of temple you will see our prime minister inaugurating temple number 1 temple number 2 claiming for temple number 3 and where is any new innovation in the field of scientific laboratory or 
type of IIT which came up in 1960s. Where is the parallel of that? So that process totally halts. Correct. Then what what remains important? How to wear the suitable clothes for the suitable occasion for uh, inaugurating Temple X, and what will be suitable for Temple Y? Right. So Correct. that that whole distraction uh, comes into being. Sir, very interesting. We spoke about society, we spoke about culture, we spoke about religion, we spoke about Hindutva, we spoke about cultural organizations. Yeah. Okay, sir, I want to uh, draw your attention to page number 317, where you wrote something very interesting. And uh, it is, at core level, values of Ambedkar and Modi Yogi is totally at variance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ambedkar was for Indian nationalism. Annihilation of caste and attributed the caste and untouchability to <coughs> Hindu. Now, Hindu scriptures. Now, sir, uh, two questions I want to ask you. I want to, I want you to elaborate on 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 what uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar believed in, and I also want you to to kind of tell me this concept of how a lot of Ambedkar people who claim to follow uh, who are who are leaders of Dalit are now. Aligned with the, the uh, Modi Yogi uh, thought process and the Modi Yogi political uh, ideologies. Very good, very good question. Now here I must first, of course, let's be very clear that it was Ambedkar who burnt Manusmriti. It was Ambedkar who was a chairman of drafting committee of India's constitution, right? Uh, I don't know whether you recall, Sujit, in uh, year 2000, there was an RSS Sarasangha Chalak, K Sudarshan. Yes. And he clearly said that Indian constitution is based on the Western values. It should be done away with. Right. So Modi Yogi school belongs to this Sudarshan level of thought. And uh, now when you are saying that how come many of the Dalit leaders, they track this. So there is, that's what that's what the brilliance of uh, Hindu politics lies. When he saw that it wants to keep the Dalits and Adivasis subjugated, but still wants to use them for their social and political purposes. They started a, a, a two organization. One was Vanvasi Kalyan Ashram. Second was Samajik Samrasta Manch. So Vanvasi Kalyan Ashram means you go to the uh, forest areas, start the ecological schools, and tell the Adivasis you are a part of us. See. And here a process of Sanskritization comes into being. I mean, Srinivas's theory, when the upper caste approach lower caste and try to relate to them, lower caste feels overwhelmed and then try to follow their path. Process number one. Correct. Second is, of course, they have also done some sort of a seva in these areas. Uh, they have started uh, some schools and other things. And that's where I think already Christian missionary schools, many places we are working. Christian mission hospitals where we are working. That's why you must have observed that there has been an attack on Christian missionaries because they want to expand their hold in the Adivasi areas. Also, by culturally indoctrinating them, by popularizing Shabri, not Sabri Mala, Shabri, correct, correct, correct. And, Ram. and Shabri and Hanuman, not correct. Ram. Ram is for urban upper caste. Mm -hmm. Ram, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Durga for upper caste urban people and Shabri and Hanuman for Vanvasi, for, for forest dwellers. So this is one. So this is a social engineering among the Dalits also. And there they have tried to project many of the Dalit icons, giving them Hindutva meaning and anti-Muslim meaning. Like there is a case of Suhail Dev. Suhail Dev was a sort of a hero uh, who, was, who had a fight with Ghazimiya for power. So they have constructed a theory that he was a Dalit who was trying to save a Hindu princess from Ghazimiya and, and all that. So one is that their work, actually that is the only organization which is working at the ground level. So culturally co-opting them into their methods like Vinayak festival in Bangalore, in Chennai, in all over the India, they have tried to popularize. So one is social engineering whereby they try to got their pulse and how to bring them towards this culture number one number two they also buy buy literally some of the dalit leaders you know one thing is sure that many of these dalit leaders are coming from very poor background and the lure of lucre is different to resist 
somebody is made a mp somebody is made a chairman somebody is given some a prestigious position this is a second way and third of course way is that uh, many of the uh, dalit politicians also who are more centered around their power rather than communities this thing they also when uh, like uh, many of the alliances they made make in up and punjab and other places so by multiple mechanisms they have tried to co-opt by social engineering some of these dalit leaders but i must tell you that there is a larger section of dalits who will go on the path of rohit rohit vemula or jignesh mewani or those people who really feel the pang of caste system and economic deprivation so definitely they have succeeded like you know there were three three big dalit leaders who were part of this ram vilas paswan of course he was always with whosoever is in power and ram vilas paswan's son chirag paswan gave a proper slogan of what these dalit leaders have a relationship with hindutva leaders this chirag paswan says i am hanuman of modi correct what is hanuman hanuman is the most loyal servant so that's what this sort of a thing has been come up and it's a uh, i must at one level compliment them compliment in a way that this difficult thing also they could crack and the real thing they they can do it only because they have done lot of ground work created thousands and thousands of pracharaks and in this ideology so that they can adopt their uh, their tactics in whichever area they work and try to win them over for their political goals you know talking to you my problem is i would like to go on and on and on and that's the no, that's uh, the pleasure of talking to you sir please. i uh, before i end this program i want to uh, i want to go to your postscript uh, where you say that nrc ca is the violation of plural democratic ethos sir uh, can you elaborate that uh, yes yeah, the issue see democratic ethos basically mean that in a area where people are living they are all part of that citizenry they are all part of the citizenry and uh, in our citizens you know even uh, they don't have uh, proper documents honestly speaking if you imagine people living in the slums people who are regularly facing the wrath of droughts or uh, uh, this in floods can we expect them to keep their papers properly where they are, they belong to and to insist that without papers you will not get citizenship is totally a concept which actually our democracy that we begin our constitution word with the word we the people of india we the people of india so that means the all those people who are living here are uh, part of it and then they bring in uh, you have to produce this card you have to produce that thing and you must also know that in assam when uh, the whole exercise was done 20 lakh people did not have proper paper and out right. of them 12 lakhs were hindus 12 lakhs were hindus correct right. but that did not make them wake up then they brought in nrc that okay hindus are anyway refugees from this country that country and all that but muslims they kept out which i don't know whether when will supreme court take up and decide whether nrc and ca they conform to the india india's constitution or not but humanely humanely how can we think of that our own citizens being pushed to the uh, camps with no facilities at all people are there they are actually earlier I, i don't want to support migration and all that but earlier people who came from bangladesh also after 1971 war it was more of economic migration and economic migration we indians are the best if you see Correct. canada america united middle east Kingdom, europe you were middle east so now so soon i think we may take over so many countries by <laughs> flooding them with our population no problem <laughs> so this that's what i mean to say that making such criterion is at one level anti constitutional legal experts can say better but from human angle human angle i feel this totally very cruel to this poor people who cannot have such facilities of keeping their documents and this thing properly 
Sir, thank you so much. Thank you so much for two reasons. Yeah. Hey, talking to me and writing such a brilliant book, writing such a beautiful book. Uh, it's available in all stands at the moment, sir. It's available in all stores. Amazon, at least Amazon and Media House online, it is available. Yes. Uh, my books generally are not so popular, so I don't know stands it may be available or not. But Amazon, it is freely available. I think uh, I think I think it's a beautiful book. Thank you so much for writing this book, sir. And thank you so much for talking to me. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sujit. My pleasure.